Welcome, everyone. <clears throat> I'm very excited to uh, have Logan back. It's been a bit, maybe a month or so. Well, that's not true. Logan and I did some private events and things like that. But for the larger guest audience, uh, as people file in here, I'm really happy to have uh, a bunch of people back today uh, for another event around financial forecasting, how to use it uh, while pitching investors. Um, I believe the, the name on this event was uh, Building Trust and Rapport. Uh, I think the title on the slide is going to be Impress Investors and Close Checks. But the difference between those two of those things is absolutely nothing. <laughs> to impress investors and close checks, you're going to need trust and rapport. So impressing is not about you know being you know fake or fake it till you make it. It's literally about grounding your startup's vision in some real reality, and those realities are usually finances. So I'm very pleased uh, that forecasters back here. If you've been to our events in the past, we do tons of programming with them. Uh, our companies are very super aligned in trying to help out founders in the earliest stage not through hype or mania or growth hacks or you know cold plunges in the morning, but rather how to use good basic business fundamentals and answer the questions and de-risk your startup. It's uncertain, it's risky, you're taking the plunge, but there's a ton of rather sober and important things you can do to really increase your chances of success and make this available for most. So uh, we're gonna run through a presentation today uh, about using your financial model in all parts of the fundraising process. Uh, we'll have some time for Q and A at the end. As always, we are recording this. We'll upload it to YouTube and stuff after we're done. Um, and use the chat, throw in where you're coming from, what's your startup name. Uh, don't pitch us, but you know, share, share the share the love and use the QA. If you have any questions throughout the program, uh, the best way to make sure they get answered, oftentimes we get overloaded with them. But if you submit a QA, it's like a ticket that I can manage and we'll try to get them if we have time at the end. Uh, you can also use the the chat as well. And I will snipe questions out of the chat if we have time. Uh, without further ado, Logan, take us away. Awesome. Thank you very much, my friend. And welcome, everybody. Always a pleasure to be talking with folks about fundraising, financial modeling, two passions that I have in life. Uh, since we are talking about fundraising, I'd like to kick things off by just getting some engagement going. So let's in the chat, everybody just type in where you're calling in from, where, where you know, where you're based, uh, just because uh, we're in an imperfect world and the fundraising climate is different depending on where you're calling in from. So we got folks, yep, L.A., United States, Philadelphia, Canada, Italy. So we got some non-US folks. Cleveland, Ohio. I'm actually in uh, just just uh, in Cincy, Ohio. Uh, Savannah, Toronto, Brazil. Good representation, right? It seems like we've got people from kind of all over the place. Uh, and that really is going to kind of inform in some ways how we think about approaching fundraising um, and, and kind of like how we want to craft the fundraising strategy. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And I'll start by kind of uh, orienting us with a little story uh, about my journey and fundraising and why this is so important to me. So uh, I'm the co-founder of Forecaster. And whenever I started the company with my co-founder, Stephen Plappert, we were in Louisville, Kentucky, right? Which is notorious. Uh, it's a notorious area for fundraising. It is very, very difficult to fundraise here in Louisville. There's not a lot of major VCs or anything like that. It's dominated by a, a handful of angel investors. And Steve and I had this idea for a company that we wanted to build called Forecaster that would help people manage their finances, forecast their finances, manage their cash flow and supercharge their business. And at the time, this was just an idea, right? We had no product, we had no sales, we had no traction, and we were in one of the hardest areas in the U.S. to fundraise. It was it was a third tier city uh, with not a lot of access to coastal venture capital. Uh, but what we did have was our analytical brains and our ability to craft a good narrative using numbers, using math, as Stephen and I both had a finance background. So what we did is we kind of thought about what we wanted to achieve. We put that narrative together in the form of a pitch deck but then we really dug into the numbers and we tried to understand for ourselves, what was the opportunity here? What would we need to do to become a very successful $100 million, billion dollar company? What were the hard metrics? What did that need to look like? And we put all of this together in what we call a financial model. And everybody that we talked about our idea with, we opened up that financial model. We walked them through that story. We showed them the metrics that we needed to hit in order to achieve our ultimate dream. The clarity that that process instilled, not only for ourselves, but for those investors who are in there digging into the numbers with us, uh, really took a, really took us to a next level when it came to fundraising. So not only were we able to close the round that we were raising at the time with no revenue, no traction, 
know nothing, but we were actually able to oversubscribe that round. Uh, so we were raising 600,000. We ended up uh, oversubscribing to $750,000. And we were able to get into one of the most competitive accelerator programs in the world, Techstars, uh, with very, very little traction, no revenue, nothing like that. So uh, this is why I'm passionate about it is if you are in kind of a position where you don't have the same access to capital as people on the coast or you know you're you you don't feel like you're in a position to where your metrics are where they need to be using a financial model using data and storytelling can really move the needle when it comes to fundraising just like it did for us and it can really help a lot of people get those rounds done and uh, have a successful fundraise so i'm going to be talking a lot about what you can do to help set yourself up for that uh, by way of introduction, I always like to say what gives me the right, you know, to sit here and talk to you all about financial modeling, about fundraising. Uh, and as I mentioned, I am the co-founder. I'm the chief operating officer here at Forecaster. You can see my partner in crime here on the screen next to me. He's not going to be joining us today. But we took that idea that we had back whenever we were raising that very early round of funding. And that was in 2000. We actually closed that round right in 2020. January of 2020 was right whenever we just decided to go on full time. We closed the round out. So we've been building for over three years now and we've achieved a lot and we've grown our team from just the two of us to now over 30 people. We've raised over $10 million or not over, oh, around $10 million for the company, actually just under $10 million for the company. Uh, and we generate millions of dollars of revenue now. So, you know, the power of metrics, the power of finance can't be understated. We use our financial model, not only to fundraise, but to actually run our entire business. So I'm going to be talking today about how I've done that, how we've done that, and how we've been able to lean into our own product and our own belief system in order to take our business to the next level, close millions of dollars and generate a bunch of revenue. And I, I want to, uh, one, congratulate you, because I, I don't think you've ever told that specific story in that order on some of our webinars, uh, but also just to ground it with, I know a lot of our founders get frustrated with this idea of like, uh, I have an idea, if only somebody would give me money, you know, like there's a chicken and the egg issue with money and ideas. Um, and I do want to clarify a little bit with Forecaster in particular, uh, the like, you can raise money on just an idea. It's exceptionally hard. It's exceptionally hard to raise a lot of money. And especially from professional investors, specifically angels will usually look for some kind of traction, you know, external validation that you are producing something valuable. And I think Logan, despite not having a product in the works, you guys did have some external validation that you could build forecasts for companies and they found them valuable. Did you not? Absolutely. Yeah. That's the other piece of that pie. So, you know, Stephen and I were fractional CFOs for a number of years. We had been selling financial models, Excel based financial models for a number of years as well. So, you know, I think a lot of times whenever theory meets reality, people have a hard time believing that people will buy something that's never existed before. In our particular case, we were selling something that had been sold for years and years and years, and we had proof that we could sell it at a certain price point. The pitch for us was, we think that we can still get people to buy it whenever we bring it into a software platform. And we think it's going to be a lot better and we can scale it a lot better. So the uh, the mountain to overcome whenever you're pitching something like that is a much smaller mountain than a net new product, net new market, never sold anything before. So there's a bit of nuance there, definitely. Um, so there's, but there's also kind of like a little dance you have to play, especially in the early days. I've got to use the data I have. I've got to use the validation I have. I have to use the experience that I have and I have to tell a story in the most compelling way possible to get the round done. So uh, it's all it's all kind of a, a nuanced stance there. Um, to talk a little bit about what Forecaster is, because I've just kind of explained it as an idea, but now tangibly, now that we're in the world, now that we're selling, now that we have hundreds of customers, uh, Forecaster is, whenever it comes down to it, an online financial modeling software, right? So, you know, the, the way that I like to explain why Forecaster came into existence was by looking at the tech stack of pretty much every company out there, right? If you look at the types of softwares that companies are using to run their businesses, you can go down every major business function and you can draw a software that superpowers that business function, right? If you're looking at sales and marketing, you can draw a line to HubSpot and, and Salesforce and things of that nature. If you're looking at even accounting on the finance side, you can look at QuickBooks, you can look at Zero. If you're looking at capital management, cap table management, you can look at 
things like Carta. And there's a bunch of different companies that are coming out to help with that. Whenever you get to financial planning, forecasting for businesses, there's no one-stop solution. There's no one software that comes to mind. And whenever we started Forecaster, there really weren't any softwares that came to mind specifically for startups and smaller businesses. They were all kind of Anaplan or NetSuite or things like that that cost tens of thousands of dollars a year. And so what we wanted to do was create the default operating system for forecasting, for financial modeling, for financial planning and analysis, and build that software that fits that part of the tech stack so that whenever it comes to finances and understanding where you're going, the things that you need to do in order to get there, we are there for you, right? We are the people that can help you achieve that goal. And we do so by creating and managing these financial models that help you hit goals, help you understand where you need to go, but then also help you tell that story, which is really what we're going to be talking about today, is the storytelling aspect of financial modeling. And that comes into play whenever it comes to fundraising. Um, you know, our superpower, oh, uh, I thought there's another slide after that, but our superpower, I would say, as far as our offering is our team. So every one of our clients, we have about 700 clients right now, they all have a financial analyst that helps them understand their finances. So we understand that financial modeling and finances and setting goals and things like that, uh, they're very tricky, especially if you don't have a finance background. So we lean into that and we say, you don't have a finance background, that's totally fine. We're going to pair you up with somebody that has an incredibly strong finance background. They're going to help you build the model for your company, understand that model, and then help you tell that story to those investors when the time comes for fundraising and then operationalize it uh, after that. So uh, we work with a ton of Gus companies. If you're interested in learning more, or talking with the team, understanding uh, if this is the right fit for you, we'd love to talk with you. Jimmy is going to throw a link in the chat. That's the best way to get in touch with us. Just fill out a form, takes just a couple minutes. Then you'll book uh, with a member of our team. They'll go through and explain exactly how we work and see if it's a good fit for you. Uh, but that's enough about Forecaster. For and you get a discount. Did oh, you and you get a discount. You do, you do get a discount. Yeah, that's 100% correct. Uh, so you get a 20% discount off of the first year. Uh, and I'll just go ahead and say prices. Uh, starts off, uh, base price is $500 per month. Uh, that's going to be discounted for Gus customers to $400 per month for the first year. That covers the build of the financial model. That covers ongoing maintenance of the financial model. So it's not something where we build it once and forget about it. Our analysts will continue to update it once a quarter. And we're even going to give you uh, presentations that you can share to your investors uh, so that it makes it keeps them in the loop and make sure that they get the information they're looking for. Uh, I will note, most people are out of compliance with their operating agreement after they get investment in. You do have the obligation to report to your shareholders after you get dollars in the door and you receive investment. We take care of that for you. So we will produce those reports that'll help keep you uh, in the loop for reporting and such. So um, that's it for Forecaster for now. I want to get in the agenda just to make sure that we maximize the time that we have together. So we're going to be talking about the power of a financial model, what it is, this nebulous thing we call financial modeling. Why is it so important? What does it help you do? We're going to talk about how you can actually communicate with it by looping it into your pitch deck, how you can present it to a uh, investor. So like, how do you run that meeting? What does that look like? And then I'm going to go through a real world example where I'm actually going to open up Forecaster's financial model. And we're going to show, I'm going to show you exactly what we showed investors whenever we raised the money that we raised. We're going to show uh, how we went through that narrative, the types of things you want to talk about, all of that stuff. Um, but as I start all of these presentations, I like to start at the very, very, very most basic, most foundational piece, just to make sure that everybody's on the same page with what is a financial model, right? Uh, seems like a very basic 101 question, which is okay. This is kind of a basic 101 talk, which is fine. Uh, but what I've found through working with tons of different companies, thousands of companies at this point, is that there seems to be this kind of intense misunderstanding of not only what a financial model is, but really why it exists, what its, what its place is in the world and why people should pay attention to it. So to help communicate that value, I actually like to use an analogy that I've stolen from a mentor of mine named Troy Hennikoff. Whenever he talks about financial modeling, he always begins by explaining the really early, early, early days of mass production of cars, right? The early days of the car manufacturing process, specifically the designing and testing phase of the car manufacturing process is really what we like to talk about when we talk about the value of a financial model. So if you're looking at this slide, 
you're seeing kind of how cars used to be built back in like probably the 50s or 60s. I never really know when these when these photos were taken, but the way that you would go about building a new design concept for a car is it would all start with pen and paper. So you would sketch out kind of a very rough mock-up of what you want the car to eventually look like. And then you would do what this guy here on the right is doing. He, he has this big slab of clay and he's taking a utensil. He's kind of he's scraping it down so that the measurements of the car fit the exact specifications that he wants it to be. He wants to understand weight distribution, what it's going to look like, how aerodynamic it's going to be. And he gets all of that done in this big kind of like clay mock-up type of thing, right? Once that's done and he has a better sense of how it's going to look, he's going to translate that into metal and rubber. And he's actually going to create a working prototype, something they can actually drive on a track. Then he's going to get some real world tester to jump into that prototype, put it on the track, and they're just going to drive it, right? They're going to see how it performs out in the real world. And then they're going to do that under a variety of different circumstances, right? So they're going to put it on a track. They're going to put it on a wet track, a dry track, maybe a track with sand on it. Maybe they're going to do it on hot days, cold days, whatever they can do to try to get the best understanding that they can of the performance of that car. They're going to do that in order to try to make it as safe as humanly possible for everybody else. But think about the person driving the car, right? This is a completely new car. Nobody has ever driven this type of a car before. And they're putting it through the absolute ringer to see what, what it can hold up to, right? Um, sometimes things would go great and it would hold up on all the tests and it would be off for mass production and everything would be good. But a lot of times, like quite a few times, there would be very severe instances of failure that could lead to catastrophic outcomes, right? And you can, this isn't very difficult to imagine. I mean, whenever you're taking a sharp 90 degree turn in a car that has an unproven wheel base and uneven distribution, cars flip over, right? Cars crash, like things go wrong whenever you're trying to innovate. And it can be incredibly dangerous, not only to the person driving the car, but to the investors, right? The people that are putting in the time, the effort, the money, all of that stuff for something that is really still a gamble, right? And whenever those things go very, very, very wrong, not only can it potentially, you know, cause loss of life in some extreme cases, uh, but they also cause the process to go all the way back to the drawing board, go back to the pen and paper, go back to the clay mock-up until eventually you do this enough times and hopefully you get things right. Uh, luckily, we've been evaded since then, right? Uh, things are not done in this way anymore. Nowadays, we have CAD, right? We have software that allows us to build these vehicles online to build them using software before they ever make their way out into the real world onto a test track. Um, so in this, you know, in this way, you can essentially simulate what a car is going to look like and you can build that virtual car, put it on a virtual track and then run it virtually through the gambit of tests, right? You can see how it's going to take that 90 degree turn. You can simulate it in thousands of different conditions, right? different variants of wetness of the track, different heat profiles, different, you know, what does it look like in snow, all of the elements, stuff like that. You can, you can test and then retest and retest all in real time and tweak those components until you get it right. And this way, if you hit an issue, not only are you going to know that you had an issue with the design, the software is going to zoom in on the point of failure, right? So if you take that 90 degree turn, the car flips over, it's going to zoom in and say your wheelbase was too wide. You need to you need to shrink it or whatever it is. You know I'm not an engineer, but it will tell you exactly what went wrong and it'll help you fix it. So the idea of building on full on prototypes to go and physically test before any kind of design testing is just not done anymore. We have we have evolved out of that, and you know we think that this is a really great analogy for financial modeling because in the same way you can use technology to simulate your business. And you can run tests in minutes instead of years. So you can see what happens if you, you know, add a new product line, you, you invest more money in marketing, or if you raise millions of dollars versus if you try to bootstrap. Um, if you're really early, like I know a lot of people on this call probably are, you can understand, is your idea even viable, right? Uh, and, and Ryan likes me telling this story of, you know, companies that we've worked with before that whenever you really force them to sit down and think through what they have to do, how many customers they have to get to hit the outcomes that they want, it's untenable, 
And Forecaster was one of those companies, right? Whenever we started, whenever we decided that we wanted to build this, we originally wanted to be a freemium solution. That was our idea. But then whenever you figure out, well, how many customers do I have to get to hit $100 million of revenue to become a billion dollar company? It's basically impossible to do that with a freemium model. So we pivoted in the early days once we made that revelation, Not that would not have been possible without financial modeling. So even whenever you're in that idea phase, it's still super important. And in a way, what you're doing is you're seeing, can your business handle a sharp 90 degree turn? Is it going to flip over into a barrel roll or are you going to be able to make it through? But in this way, if there are issues, you're uncovering them super early. Nobody gets hurt. You don't get hurt. Your co-founders don't get hurt. Investors don't get hurt. And it really gives you a chance to optimize everything before you jump in head first and waste a ton of time and money. So this is why we're really passionate about it is whenever it's done right and utilized correctly, it can transform your business and help you make really good financial decisions way earlier than you would if you just had to play it out in the real world. I'll just jump in real quick in case I'm sure there's people from every industry coming uh, into this kind of thing, but freemium would be the idea that you have a tool available for free for anybody with a limited feature set, but there's a premium feature set that some people pay for. Historically in the internet space, the percentage of people who actually pay for freemium tools is incredibly small, like conversion rates in the single digits. But what that allows you to do is even if you anticipate a conservative conversion rate to premium, uh, it gives you a market size. So you can look at, you know, is it, you know, order of magnitude achievable, you know, if we had X amount of people using it and 5% of them paid for it. Um, and that's the kind of thing that it's really easy to just like look at other companies in the space and be like, well, it worked out for them. And it's like, yeah, some companies have billions of users. So that actually works. You know, if your target market is a human being with a pulse, it's much bigger than a business that needs a you know financial model that exists in these kind of countries that you know uses this sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, that's hundred percent correct. I think the number that we landed on for us to hit our goal is we were going to have to get over a million people using our software in order to get to a hundred million dollars of revenue uh, in the freemium model. And because we're selling to startups, there's you could argue that there's not a million startups actively in the U.S. right now. Um, so that was a really, really challenging kind of like point for us to get over. So that's why we decided to pivot. So um, yeah, definitely. So that's kind of the theory, right? Um, and it's going to essentially a financial model is really going to help you kind of like simulate, understand your business. So once a simulation is built, you can ask it pretty much any question that you want and you can get visibility into your business in a variety of different areas. Uh, but it's going to tell you a lot of different things, right? Uh, if you're fundraising, if you're trying to go out into the venture ecosystem and raise money, it's going to tell you some questions that are really important to fundraising, like how much money should you raise, right? We talk to founders all the time that say, we're raising a million dollars, we're raising $2 million. But then if you press them on it and you say, well, why are you raising a million dollars? Why are you raising $2 million? What are you spending the money on? What's going to be the plan with that? They kind of fall apart if you put some pressure on it, right? Uh, and And you've kind of learned that Maybe they don't actually know why they're raising a million or $2 million. It's just a number that sounds good. If a financial, if you have a financial model, uh, you can answer that question with very, very strong precision. You can say $2 million will buy me 18 to 24 months worth of runway, assuming no revenue, assuming we hire these people and you know have these expenses, right? Boom, that's why we're raising that much. And we have a buffer on top of it. Gives you a really tight buttoned up answer. Whenever you have tight buttoned up answers, that inspires confidence with investors, confident investors tend to write checks, right? Um, you know, it's going to it's gonna help you really outline what you're going to be spending money on, but it's also going to help you outline how you plan on growing, right? So if I'm a new startup and I'm about to go out and try to make my first sale, how am I going to be making that first sale? What is the plan for doing that? Once you get the first 100 sales, how do you think you're going to grow beyond that, right? You could be wrong, you could be dead wrong, and you probably are, to be honest. But I want to see where your head is, right? Where where are you thinking? Are you going to be investing in paid ads? Are you going to be hiring a sales force? Are you going to be you know, leveraging partners or affiliates or things like that? And how many customers do you need to X, whatever that X means for you? If you're on the VC fundraising route, then if I'm raising a pre-seed round, I want to see how many customers do I need to do to get to get to where I can realistically raise a seed round, right? So if I'm wanting to raise a seed round after my first round, 
And what do I need to do to get to call it $20,000 a monthly reoccurring revenue, right? And then whenever I want to raise a series A, what do I need to get to get to 150,000 to $200,000 a monthly reoccurring revenue and so on and so forth. So you're essentially wanting to show the investor, you know what you need to do in order to get to that next milestone. And you have somewhat of a plan for how to do that, whether it's right or wrong. And that's the plan that you're going to execute on and learn from and so on and so forth. Right. And it tells you a lot more than this, but this is just kind of the, some of the basic things that I wanted to put on the slide. And it's important, not just for telling that story and convincing the investor that you know what you're doing and convincing the investor that you have a good handle and a good plan for execution, but also for yourself, right? I mean, there's a reason investors are asking these types of questions is because they want to be assured that you have a plan. They want to be sure that you have an idea of how to execute on what you're promising. And if you don't, you know, have a good plan, then, uh, you know, there's probably a reason why, why they may choose to pass. So a financial model is just going to help you help you get through that barrier. So we are asked a lot about, as you may imagine, when do I need to invest in, in, in a financial model? When does it make sense for me to spend the time to really sit down and build out uh, this type of framework for fundraising? Um, so I will say that the answer to that question has changed, I would say, considerably. And, and Ryan, I'm actually curious to see if you would agree with this. But in very recent years, I would say this, this uh, answer has changed. I would say um, typically at the pre-seed and seed level, a financial model isn't 100% necessary to get a round done. And I would say that that's still the case, right? That you don't absolutely have to have a financial model in order to successfully close an earlier round, you know, whenever you're doing, call it less than $100,000 a monthly reoccurring revenue. You can get a round done without it. It's not 100% necessary, but I will also say that in a lot of ways, these are some of the most competitive rounds of fundraising because the, the funnel is widest at the top and you are competing against a lot of people who have good ideas with maybe not a ton of traction quite yet. And an investor's job is to say no most of the time. And so you are literally competing to get that investor's attention. You're competing to make that investor believe that you know what you're doing, you have a good plan. Uh, and the way to do that is not to skimp out on the basics. So our recommendation is to invest in the process early on because, and you'll see this on the slide, by the time you get to series A, by the time you're raising at you know $100,000 of monthly recurring revenue and, and, and beyond, it's complete table stakes. An investor is going to need to see your financial model when it comes to fundraising. This is just a part of their due diligence. It's a part of understanding and underwriting the deal. So you're going to eventually have to do it. It makes sense to do it earlier on. The reason that I say that this has changed in recent years is we're noticing that the there there is more of a demand from investors on financial modeling today than there ever has been before. Uh, you know, I would say a year ago even. You could much you could much more easily get by at a pre-seed and seed stage without a financial model. These days, even at the pre-seed and seed stage, I think investors are asking for financial models, or at least a subset of them are starting to ask for financial models earlier on. And I think that that's for two reasons. I think it's because markets uh, went through some turbulence recently, and people are wanting to have a better plan for cash flow management. Investors are wanting to see a better plan for cash flow management. So I think that's one reason. But the other reason is I think tools and softwares are becoming available to where this should not be an issue anymore. Like people like Forecaster exist now that the barrier to getting a financial model built, it used to be much higher and now it's much lower. So people are kind of seeing it as table stakes, you know, earlier in the process. Uh, than they have been for the past like year or so. Uh, that's been my observation. Uh, and my recommendation is to just invest in the process as early as you can, because eventually you're going to need it anyway. Right? I'll say, um, I think it largely holds true as well. I think you will always find in the startup space, um, things always accelerate towards the earlier stage. So just the example of like, it used to cost several hundred thousand dollars to run a software business in the pre-seed level. 
because you needed to hire an IT person, you needed to buy physical servers, you needed somewhere to run them, you needed AC, you needed connection to the internet that was good enough. So like to pitch a company back then was so much bigger pre Amazon. And I think you'll find the same thing, even with Gus Launch, like we built Gus Launch, which runs and automates a Delaware C corporation. If you had asked me seven or eight years ago, if you had an idea in a startup and you think it could be big, should you be an LLC or a Delaware C corp? I would significantly weigh the decision and be like, well, to set up a Delaware C Corp, like you need to work with a lawyer, you need to do the right filings, you need to get the right documents in place, you need to, you know, probably pay them a couple thousand dollars, you know, just to be sure that everything's set. So if you don't know where you're going with this company, it's a software company, you're you're thinking big, but you're not sure yet. Maybe it's better to just form an LLC. It's a, a couple hundred bucks and like it basically you have to write, you have to do a report and you don't have to keep paying the lawyers. But now right. Gus Launch is 300 bucks a year and we do all that stuff for you. So it's like the best practices are there. The standards are there. The software is available. And I think you'll only see that continuing like every aspects of startups. Uh, the more interesting thing, I think seeing the line move uh, has really occurred to me just in the last couple of weeks, uh, yeah. you know, pulling the cover off a little bit. Logan has been participating in a program we're running called Mission Control Launchpad, which is an intensive like six week company designed to take people with kind of early stage ideas and make sure they have every single element of their startup kind of locked down from the entity side, from how to pitch their thing to forecasting and financial modeling to ensuring that they're, you know, all, you know, their equity splits make sense. And we've been working more hands-on with a couple dozen founders. And while I will say that this line of the, you know, table stakes for a separator does feel like it exists and you can raise money um, without a full financial model. What I have noticed is while no investor would cite the absence of a financial model for a pre-seed round was the reason that they said no. I think you will often find two degrees away from that is the misinformation in the founder's head because they didn't go through the process of building out a financial model is why the investor said no. Somebody comes to you and says, well, my total addressable market is $60 billion. Like all we need to capture is 1% of it. Like this is, you know, made, this is, gonna, this is so easy. You know, like there, of course there's an opportunity here clearly showing the founder didn't walk through and the idea of like, oh, no, no, you're like a niche within that. You know, some people say like, well, AI is a total addressable market of X billion. It's like, okay, but like, is this AI to help ships chart themselves 10% more efficient? Or is this AI for healthcare of a disease that only 0.0001% of the population has or et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of founders don't go through that thought process because it is vague and unwieldy and very nebulous to do that you know, in conversation, you know, pouring over data and whatnot. But once you actually put it into something and start to, you know, make conjecture about it, to talk with your co-founder, your advisors about like, is this reasonable? Is this realistic? You start to answer different questions about your business that will go into your pitch. So even though the finances an investor will maybe look like, look at is like five years of annuals, like revenue expenses growth, uh, the act of doing it, I think, Maybe it's it's a different kind of table stakes, but I'm more and more convinced that like it's one of the most important parts of uh, seeing if your idea is feasible. And investors are trained to think about the feasibility of your idea from first contact. Um, so it really is that line is moving and it's already probably moved quite a bit. I agree. And I want to run a small social experiment if you guys will indulge me. If you have been asked by an investor for a financial model, could you type in the chat? Yes, right now. If you've been asked by an investor to see your financial plan, so we've already got a couple of yeses. Yeah, there you go, Ryan's already in there. Yeah, see, I mean, like people are just popping off here saying yes, 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 yes. I mean, I, I just, that's that's just the trend that I'm seeing out there is just more and more people are wanting to dig into the numbers, even at an earlier stage, even at an idea stage. So hopefully all the yeses in the chat already right now are kind of convincing you to, hey, if you're not paying attention to this, at some point, it's not a, a matter of, if it's a matter of when, uh, somebody's going to ask you for this and you're going to want to be prepared for that instead of saying, oh, hold on, let me take two weeks, go and put this together, then come back to you because by the time you're doing that, you, I'm sorry, you've lost the deal. Um, so that's that's why this stuff is so important. So uh, I want to move along because I, I just realized that we're pretty pretty significantly behind pace here. So I'll try to pick things up. I want to make sure we got plenty of time for Q&A. Um, we get asked all the time, you know, I've got this financial model. I'm telling this story. How do I loop this into the conversation? Usually the early conversations with investors happen in the pitch deck, right? The visual narrative of how you plan on growing the company, that happens in the pitch deck. There's usually a slide in there that alludes to something around a forecast. And that's really where the conversation begins when it comes to financial modeling, I would say 90% of the time. 
right? So how do you use a financial model in your pitch deck? Well, there's a few tips uh, that I like to kind of call out whenever it comes to looping in this type of information in the pitch deck. Um, so the key to showing slides in a pitch deck is you want to keep it relatively high level and not go too deep in the weeds. Um, so I recognize too that this example slide, I wanted to use a real slide that actually was used in a real life fundraise. This is forecaster slide that we use in our finance, uh, in our fundraising deck, right? In our pitch deck. Um, our slide was more number heavy than I would recommend for the average company. And that's because that's on brand for us. We're a financial modeling company. It makes sense for us to show a decent number, like a bunch of numbers, right? Just because that's really what we do. Um, but for most people, what I would recommend is something a little bit more visual, something that is maybe a graph, right? A revenue, or maybe even just kind of like big call out numbers of the important numbers, just to really show that the opportunity is there. This is something that's worth paying attention to. That's really what you're trying to do here is you're just trying to show we are marching towards something that is sufficiently large enough that it's going to check the box for you from an investable perspective, right? We can, in theory, become a billion dollar company. If that's what you're looking for, our financial forecast can, can support that, right? But you want to strike that balance of giving the right information, which in this case is just kind of the big, most important numbers, without going too deep in the weeds and dragging the investor through every single assumption that is ultimately creating this financial model, right? That's the balance that you're wanting to strike. And the reason that you want to not go too deep in the weeds is because you have to remember the pitch deck is used in those early meetings when you're still trying to get emotional buy-in from the investor, right? Usually when it comes to fundraising, step one is getting the investor to care about the problem, to care about what you're trying to do. And whenever you bring them into the reality of the forecast and the numbers and the metrics, if you do that too early, you're dragging them in too deep too early before you've gotten that emotional buy-in, right? And a lot of times what we've seen happen whenever you go into the numbers too quickly is people, um, you know, they, they get too deep into the weeds and they get kind of number fatigue analysis paralysis type of deal. An investor will do one of two things if they, if they latch on, they will either you know, try to go deep into the numbers and that eats up a lot of time to try to understand the numbers whenever you're trying to get that emotional buy-in, uh, they're either going to do that or they're going to shut down whenever they see a bunch of numbers on a screen and they're gonna their brain's going to shut off, right? You don't want either of those two things to happen. You just want to communicate the vision. You just want to communicate that it's a big opportunity. It's an opportunity worth paying attention to. So you want to keep it high level. You want to just show that you check the box and then you want to kind of move on. But really what you want to do is you want to try to establish that next touch point with the investor using that slide as the hook, right? So if you put slides like that on the screen, like this, right? If you if you show this to an investor, a savvy investor is going to say, okay, where did you get those numbers, right? I want to understand the logic that's going behind this. That's a lot of growth. How are you going to achieve that? Stuff like that. That's your hook to set up this next meeting. And this next meeting is whenever you're going to go through with a fine tooth comb, all of the logic that backs up those numbers, right? Uh, for those of us that have fundraised before, we know that it's a game of building trust, right? Investors invest in founders that they trust and trust is built through familiarity and confidence, right? So you want to get as much face time with the investor as you possibly can, because that builds familiarity. They're going to get to know you better. They're going to get more comfortable with you. And whenever you're doing that, you want to inspire confidence, right? And going through your financial plan is one of the most confidence-inspiring things that you can do to an investor because it's your way of showing the investor how you're going to take their dollars and turn that into more dollars using math logic. Um, and it, so it's a very confidence-inspiring activity. So that's the goal. The goal is to pique their interest and pique it enough to where you can get another meeting on the books, which is very, very important. So now I want to talk about that next meeting, right? So you've, you've had the initial pitch, you've showed them the model, they've been intrigued by the numbers, they want to understand how you got those numbers. Now, how do you present that model to investors, right? Uh, so I kind of segment things into the three phases of any meeting, which is before the meeting, during the meeting, and after the meeting, right? 
So before the meeting, we recommend don't let a model stand alone. Don't share your financial model with the investor before you've had the chance to meet with them. This, this is a somewhat controversial point. People have different opinions here and I've thought a lot about it. I've seen what I've seen out in the marketplace. I still believe this to be true where a financial model is a complex living document with a lot of logic built into it. And it's not a document that is meant to stand on its own without you there to explain it, right? So a lot of times investors will ask, hey, just send me your financial model. We've got a team of analysts. We can dig in. We can understand it. We don't need to waste each other's time for a meeting. Just send it to me. I would hold your ground. I would say, no, I would say I would be more than happy to share my financial model with you. But if you were going to do that, I need to be in the room. I need to show you the logic. I need to explain to explain it to you so that you get the proper context so that you understand uh, exactly what's going on here. This is going to do a couple of different things. So one, it's going to give you that leverage point to get that next meeting, right? We've established you want more FaceTime. More FaceTime with the investor is a good thing. So one of the things that you can do to get that FaceTime, to get that meeting on the books uh, would be to say, I would like to walk you through our financial model in real time to give you that context. If you want to go through it, then I need to be in the room. It's a good way to get leverage. Two, it's going to demonstrate your understanding whenever you actually do present the model. Um, if you're showing the understanding of the model, you're essentially showing your understanding of your own business and all of the metrics within your business because it's a simulation. So those two things directly translate. That's going to inspire that confidence if you can do that in a very buttoned up way. But most importantly, it's going to allow you to control the narrative, right? So if an investor sees a financial model for the first time without you in the room, they are going to react to it in some way, right? It's going to be positive, negative, or neutral. Um, and you want to be there while that opinion is being formed because we've already talked about investors are in the business of saying no most of the time. They're going to be looking at your model through a skeptical lens and they're going to find things. They're going to be looking for things that they disagree with in that model or they want to challenge in that model. And they're going to find things in that model. I can guarantee you that they're going to want to challenge that they may not disagree with, that they might have questions about. You want to be there so that you can control how that opinion is being formed so that you can help alleviate those concerns or speak to them while it's happening real time anyway in their head. Because like it or not, once a first impression is made, it is way harder to change a first impression than it is to help that first impression essentially be formed in the first place. If you're not in the room while that first impression is being formed, there's nothing you can do about it. You're just kind of at the whim of the investor that day and what they happen to pick up on. If I'm there while you're seeing the model, I can help influence that in some ways. So that's why we recommend be there, be in the meeting and try to uh, be present whenever you're showing the financial model. And then during the meeting, you know, be prepared and be in control. You know, people go into these meetings, they're very, they feel very nervous about them because it's a very complex document that they're having to walk through. They feel like the investor trying to rip it to shreds. Uh, I would say, don't let that happen. Just spend the time, be familiar with the document, be familiar with your financial model and treat it like a working session where you are using the model just as a tool to tell your story about the passion that you have, right? About your business, about what you're trying to achieve and about what your team needs to do in order to achieve that vision. And you just present what you and your team think is realistic and what you put together and what you're striving towards and then have a conversation about that. If they want to push back on it, that's fine. That's their opinion. They're entitled to it. But you need to kind of be firm in your opinion, but also be coachable and just kind of like treat it as a conversation point uh, in, in this business that you're trying to build. Remember, a lot of investors are really smart people. A lot of them are ex-founders. And they may have information or guidance that you may not be privy to. And so you want to ask about their opinion, show that you input their experience, uh, but also show and hold firm that, you know, there's a lot of thought that went into this model and you feel strongly that these, you know, what you're trying to do here is, uh, is reasonable, aggressive, but it gets everybody the outcome that they're looking for. And then after the meeting, always follow up, play like a champion is what they taught us in the tech stars. Uh, so that means follow up with an email, thank them for their time, summarize what you talked about. Then you can include uh, your model in that follow-up. Once the contact has been made, once you've given them the information that they're looking for, they can go through that document at their heart's desire. There's absolutely no issue in that. And then they can do any number of things that they want to with it. So, um, you know, I'm always, by the way, happy to help answer 
tricky questions that came about in those meetings. If you get blindsided by a deep in the weeds financial question, uh, that's one of the things we love doing at Forecaster is helping founders navigate those types of conversations. Um, so, you know, those are those are always, uh, you know, interesting conversations whenever they happen about, you know, going through the financial model and things like that. So uh, I want to spend a little bit of time going through. Real quick, Logan, uh, Christine asked a great relevant question <clears throat> that I think you kind of hit on, but I'll make it directionally. Are you suggesting that you don't include the financial model in the data room? Yeah, so that's so that I, yeah, I've gotten that question a couple of times before. Um, that is where it gets a little bit kind of um, it depends on how you want to operate. So what what Forecaster did, for an example, was we had a financial model in our data room with a corresponding Loom video of us walking through our financial model. So the idea there is they're going to see us and get the context from us whenever we're walking through the financial model. And then they go through it. So if they happen upon it just through going through your data room, um, then you know you just want to you want to be thoughtful about how that data is presented. I would say it's probably fine if it's in your data room. But what I would suggest if they're wanting to go through, if they're wanting to set up a meeting specifically to go through your financial model, and they're requesting a copy of your model prior to that meeting, that's whenever I would say hold off on it and hold your ground and then give them the context in that meeting. If it's just a general data request, um, then I would say it's probably okay uh, that if that's not the thing that they're trying to zoom in on, but also kind of be thoughtful about how you do it. Uh, another way that I've seen it done, by the way, is a um, is like a PDF of the output of your financial model with a video link in it to where it forces you to really watch the video to get to get and then to book a meeting with the calendar link. So it really depends on your style, depends on your personal brand. Uh, but there's a couple of different ways that you can navigate that. The data room is the tricky piece of that though, for sure. And Jeff <laughs> Jeff is saying, just leave it in there. You, you don't want to turn investors off. Uh, I think it's worth noting that when we say data room, it can mean a variety of different things. So if you apply to an investor group on Gust, they're going to ask for the financials on your Gust profile, which is basically the five-year financials. And there's optional to upload documents and whatnot. Most angel groups do not make those documents required because what they're looking for at first contact is just the pitch. Does the market yeah. make sense for their investor group? Is the opportunity big enough? Is it you know in their thesis or whatever? They're not going to pour through financial models. It would take them forever. Their job would be incredibly ridiculous. When you get a real data room set up, you probably already have a lead investor or somebody who's seriously interested in the investment or leading the investment. And that's when the financial model becomes an asset in a collaborative piece of you know content. So if you're further along into the diligence discussion, your data room should be the God's honest truth of everything about your business. And it should back up every single thing that was in your pitch deck at a level of fidelity that is 30x. Okay, I'm not going to use 30x. I use that too much. But 10x uh, what yep. you pitched in your 15 minute pitch or something like that. So there's kind of a, a tightening of the aperture or widening of the aperture, depending on what direction you want to look at it in terms of specificity. So in no way do you want to withhold information or like obfuscate it, but uh, at certain levels of the relationship, more transparency just gets unlocked on both sides. Big and time. I have a and really quick question before the demo. Oh, sorry to sure. do a comment on that one, Logan. Oh yeah. I was going to, I was going to say one thing. It's like every investor is different, but generally as a high level, by the time you're making your way through the data room to your point, Ryan, the decision, the emo the decision on whether or not they would like to invest has hopefully been made by that point. And you're now validating and you're going through your checklist to make sure that there's no red flags anywhere. So the, the conversation that I was having earlier about like going through that, that was still whenever they were in that decision making process of like, do we want to pursue this investment? Right. If it's more of a okay, we get it, we love the vision, we love that, we love everything. Now we're just kind of like going through our checklist to make sure that everything lines up and everything's good. That's a little bit of a different, you know, navigatable conversation. So, um, yeah. And, and one yeah, real, we, yeah, real quick thing, because this is a cool opportunity. Uh, we have somebody from one of our angel groups that use our platform in the chat. Uh, Chemical Angels, long time, uh, great resource in the space for any uh, startups in the chemical kind of adjacent industry. Uh, so this is an angel group um, and they see a lot of early stage and seed stage companies that don't have a financial model or it's way too optimistic. Uh, is Forecaster open to working in reverse? 
So if the group uh, says, hey, we have some high, you know, high potential startups here, but they could really use some help on financial modeling, could they send them to you or negotiate? I'm happy to make an intro. Oh, yeah, that. make it. Let's let's handle that one uh, privately. Please do make an intro. And we have done some work like that where we've just done some, some uh, negotiated deals to help that and help. We're actually doing that with a venture fund right now. It's really cool work. Um, so yeah, happy to happy to chat more about that. It's not in our standard offering, but we can we can maybe do some custom. Cool. Awesome. Appreciate it. I'm going to fly through this demo because I really want to make sure that we have time. We've only got about 10 minutes for questions. I'm just going to talk about a general flow that I like to use whenever it comes to presenting financial models to investors. Um, I do the zoom out, zoom in approach. It's something that we've talked about, which is um, you start with that zoomed out vision of what you hope to achieve. So I start on the income statement. I show what we are shooting for in terms of revenue, in terms of net income. So hopefully at this point, this is a, you know, depending on the scenario you want to use while you're fundraising, uh, the idea here is to show big opportunity, opportunity worth paying attention to, and then you zoom in. So you start zoomed out and then you zoom in to show like, this is what we're going to do on a month to month basis in order to ultimately hit those big numbers that we just showed you that big, you know, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. This is how we're going to chip away at that on a month to month basis. So you can see kind of what that revenue ramp is going to look like. If you're using Forecaster, this is Forecaster, by the way, we use our own product. I can show you how we've been doing, you know, in trying to hit this vision. I can see the variance on revenue of what we've been able to hit and what we haven't. And I can even dive in even deeper to show you individual variances and things like that. And then we go into the actual narrative itself of how specifically we're going to be doing this. So I'm going to detail out all of the different ways that we're getting new customers from organic search to paid search to social media to paid social, all of the different ways that we're getting customer. I have individual metrics that we need to hit there and even split goals in order to, uh, you know, go up to hitting those top level goals. I can show how that translates into revenue. So how all of those new customers are ultimately going to factor into our revenue formula what does the team need to look like in order for us to hit these types of goals? How does that scale over time? What other expenses do we have? This is why we need your money in order to facilitate these expenses. And then uh, what is cash going to look like along the way? You can see we're unprofitable. So we're burning that cash until we eventually turn a profit and then it goes back up. And then that takes us to the promised land. I always end on the equity section by saying, this is why we're talking, right? This is why we need this money is because all of these great things that we just talked about, none of it is possible unless we get this investment. So it's a good way to end on the ask. Um, so that's the general flow. Um, and I do want to make sure that we have a little bit of time for q and I'll close things off by saying again, uh, if you want to work with Forecaster, if you like what you see here, if you like what you, uh, what you heard today, we'd love to work with you. We'd love to at least talk with you to see if it's a good fit. Uh, for us to work together. So Jimmy's going to throw the link in the chat just one more time. Um, and that's the best way to get in touch with us. And with that, I will turn it over for uh, some questions. Awesome. Thank you, Logan. And thank you for tolerating my uh, <laughs> commentary, which extended uh, the length of this for sure. No worries. Uh, back up to, so we're actually having some fun time in the chat about investor expectations and returns. Uh, Sean asked uh, 20 minutes ago or so, how do I deal with the I don't believe you number, especially with investors that are not domain experience? The I don't believe you number in that, like, I've got this big audacious revenue. Yeah, goal. I'm assuming, like, we'll be making $500 million a year in the next five years, kind of. Thing. Oh, yeah. So chip into that. I mean, if you spend some time really digging in to that big audacious goal that you have for the company, and they say, I don't believe that, my response to that is, well, what don't you believe about that? Like what, which part, when, I, when you can do this, when you have a financial model. So like if I go in here, just to kind of share my screen again. Um, so if I go in here and I say forecaster is going to make, you know, uh, you know, $18.74 million by 2027. And the investor says, I don't believe in that. I don't think that you can actually do that. Which of these two numbers don't you believe? Okay. I don't believe that 16.8 million. All right. Well, of that 16.8, these are all of the different packages that we have. Which one of those do you have a problem with? 8.59, okay, the essentials monthly. So now I can go in and well, let's zoom in on that. All right, the essentials monthly, here's all of our assumptions here. So we're assuming an 8% churn rate, 2% upgrade rate, 2%, you know what I mean? And we can like have this dialogue and I can say, look, the math is the math. Like if we charge, 
you know, this 400 and whatever dollars per month, even at a churn rate of this, even at our customer acquisition, this is what the number ends up being over this period of time. So it, so it's really just more about zooming in and understanding the logic that gets to that and then figuring out the reason that they have, like, what is the thing that actually gives them pause? They may find after you really dig in and see that they might be like, well, man, you're right, actually, like the math is that and maybe that is realistic. Or they might say, yeah, it's that churn rate. It's that churn rate that's the issue, I think. Okay, let's talk about churn rate. What, what do you think we're doing right? What do you think we're doing wrong? How would you combat that churn rate? You know what I mean? You have more interesting conversations whenever you do this exercise because it forces you to look at the thing. It forces them to confront the thing that is giving them that pause. And then you have a conversation about that. And then you either resolve it or you don't, but at least you hit the root of the issue, right? So that's how I tend to handle those types of questions. Awesome. And we have another uh, frequent and great question that we get all the time. Um, what if you don't have any revenue yet? Uh, whether you're an industry that needs like FDA approval, like a medical or just you're super early, what isn't a financial model just all made up? Uh, so in the more, so is it all made up? Yes. Uh, <laughs> doesn't mean that it's not useful. Um, so generally, you know, what a financial model is at the end of the day is it's a series of educated guesses, it's mathematical formulas with inputs that you think are reasonable that you've worked on with your team that in theory, if you can execute on a certain outcome is going to happen, that is something that you're marching towards, right? Something that you're really hoping to achieve. Um, if you're brand new and it's just an idea and you don't know what any of that data is, then yeah, a lot of that is going to be quote unquote made up in the sense that you don't know what the actual values of those inputs are going to be, but that doesn't make that any less useful, right? Because in my example, whenever Forecaster built our first financial model, were the numbers made up in the freemium model? Yep, totally made up. I had no idea what our churn rate was going to be. I didn't know what our price was going to be, but it gave me a starting point that I could actually look at if these are the numbers, this is what's going to happen. In that particular case, whenever I put the numbers that are reasonable and realistic, the, the outcome was not good. And that caused us to pivot, right? The outcome was we would need 100% market penetration to achieve our goals. So that gave us data that we can go back to change our business model. And then once we started actually getting data, we could feed that into the forecast and then we can make better and better and better decisions. So it's all made up for the record, even if you're IBM and you've been around for 20 years, if you're looking at what your projections are for three years now, that's made up. That's made up, right? Uh, it's based on good logic, but it hasn't happened yet. So it, how can it not be made up? It has to be. <laughs> Right? There, no, there would be no such thing as layoffs if uh, financial models were guaranteed into the future. Exactly. But there's a reason that financial modeling and FP&A is a core business function of businesses of a certain size, even though it's all made up. It's still incredibly valuable. Uh, I got some quick forecaster functionality questions. Uh, the numbers that you're showing in the tool, are they linked to Google Analytics or something? Or are they manually entered? How does that work? Good question. So right now we've got two live integrations. So we have an integration with um, QuickBooks and Zero, which are the just accounting integrations that we have. We're working on a whole suite of integrations. We want to plug up your financial model to pretty much every system that you use eventually. But Forecaster is also a startup. So we're just kind of working our way through the roadmap right now. Uh, but I will say that with our analysts that help you, uh, they can, if we don't integrate with whatever platform you're using, they can manually go in take your data and make sure that that gets put into Forecaster because we can do manual data uploads that they will just take on as a part of the package. So, um, but yeah, if you have any questions about that, talk to the AE, fill out the form, and then we can address those with you individually. Uh, we got a couple left, but I want to be uh, appreciative of your time, Logan. If you have a hard stop, uh, we can wrap it up and um, I'll do the outro. How are you doing? I can do, I can do maybe just a couple more minutes. I am going to have to leave here in just a second, but I can do maybe two, three more questions. All right. The most common one that's always on everybody's mind, uh, and I'm going to reverse it. Dave asked the question of what kinds of business models uh, does this work for or revenue modeling like LTV or subscription or, you know, single, you know, per project. Is there any business model forecaster doesn't work for? Um, technically, we can work with any business model. There are business models that are more challenging for us to work for than others, um, like stuff that I don't think would apply to most people on this call, like wealth management or but like if you're a lender and you have like a bunch of loans out with different terms and things like that, that can be a little bit tricky. But 
generally, I would say for people on this call, yes, we can work with you. We can mix and match revenue streams. We can tailor it completely to your, your needs. Uh, and if you have like a really niche, nuanced, individual kind of revenue stream that you think there's no way we can handle, get on the call with the AE. They'll talk to it with you. Yeah, we'll see if we can handle it. We probably can. Um, but you know, it's, it's always good just to do your diligence. So yeah, from a startup standpoint, I haven't seen anybody who has, they, they come in being like, but I'm different. You don't understand that I'm a marketplace that also has a subscription box company that also does, you know, freemium services. It's like, oh yeah, cool. Just like add a couple yeah. more rows. Yeah, it happens all the time. Yep. Um, I think that gets most of them. Um, but even some, uh, languishing, we do more programming and forecaster all the time. Uh, we're also working them into some of our uh, deeper dive um, education that we have coming up. So be on the lookout for emails for me. Uh, you'll see more from Logan and Steven and the forecaster team, and we'll have more opportunity to ask, uh, answer deeper dive questions in some future programming that we're doing. Other than that, Jimmy and Logan, thank you so much for your time as always. Um, we love these things. The audience is usually really, really well engaged. And we have some great questions and uh, yeah, we'll be back. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much, Ryan. Appreciate it. And hope to see you guys next time. Yep. Happy Halloween, everyone. Yeah. Bye.